Good evening, everyone. Uh, to those of you who heard me talk about the Fenland flora before, before uh, I hope there's enough novel information in what I've got to say to you tonight to make it worthwhile. Um, my, this, Although it's builders by me, you'll see that very much the talk is a joint effort with my colleague, uh, John Graham. Uh, it was our partnership that motivated this flora. So my first question really is why, what are floras for and why on earth do, uh, d does one write a Fenland flora? If we look at um, the example of a county which has a, makes a big contribution to Fenland, you'll see that um, the, it, it sort of fulfills two purposes. It can be a historical account, uh, documenting what has happened to, uh, to the vegetation, to the flora of a particular area over the over the years, or Goodness me. It can be, in a sense, a snapshot in time. Um, now, by that, I mean you, you agree to, if you like, present something which deals with a 10-year or 20-year survey, and you do nothing. You, that's all you really report. But most floras um, synthesize the two and attempt to do to fulfill both purposes. The modern flora really began in the post Second World War uh, phase, and to that, to so large extent, John Doney, the the writer for Bedfordshire and Hertfordshire, was the pioneer here, and his floras, uh, which co which included later plant atlases, uh, answered a number of questions. They said, "Where does this, which species?" are present in the county at this moment where do they occur what are their habitats their ecology where did they occur in the past where has it had that have locations been lost if there have been changes can we either demonstrate what the cause of those changes might be uh, uh, and can we even quantify them Doni didn't present simply a catalogue but he added these uh, his so-called habitat studies, which were uh, a novel idea and which many local uh, later flora writers copied to illustrate exactly where and how species grew together in their area. He covered uh, a big scope. He covered not just the flowering plants and pteridophytes, but he paid attention to bryophytes, to stoneworts and to lichens. And as well as dealing with native and natu naturalized species, he looked at casual species as well. Goodness me. Apologies, everybody. The, there it goes. Right. Uh, I warn you, if there seems to be a hiatus between um, images, it's because for some reason, um, the uh, I have to hit the button several times. So I apologize in advance. The counties that overlap Fenland have got a mixed history when it comes to flora writing. Cambridgeshire is very much the leader in terms at least of uh, uh, prolific production. Look, uh, those, those are major and, and supplement and checklist floras going back well over 300 years. Huntingdonshire, uh, had much more patchy uh, uh, coverage until the two, 2003 floor. Lincolnshire, especially when one considers that it's one of the biggest counties in England and one of the bigger counties in Britain as a whole, really has had a very, very little coverage over the years in published floors. Norfolk is almost a competitor to, Lincoln, to Cambridgeshire. Northamptonshire, rather few. And Suffolk, again, several major floras spaced out over the last 150 years. The Fenland flora is different to these kinds of county floras. Our focus is on a natural unit, something defined by geology and soils, by climate, um, by landscape, by land use, 
by the way that land has been has been used in the past and by ecology. By doing this, by going across county boundaries and drawing a line around a natural area, we hope to answer more questions about what the reasons are for the distributions that we observe, whether those whether those reasons be natural to do with intrinsic variation in the environment, or whether they're brought about by human activity. In that way, also, we hope it's a holistic account. It doesn't, it's not a, a, a mix of bits and pieces. Counties are often have little fragments that are not representative of the bulk of the county. That can make the county floor was particularly fascinating, but it, we hope to, by taking a slightly different viewpoint to reveal interesting patterns. We're not the first to do this. It would be nice to say we were pioneers, but there are precedents from 1979, John Trist's Flora of the Breckland, uh, again, addressing a natural area and covering three counties. And more recently, the Flora of Birmingham, the Black Country, looking at what uh, an area developed for industry and also an area uh, unlike Breckland, where which many botanists would have dismissed as boring and industrial. Well, the Fenland gets dismissed as very flat and boring, so it, uh, ignored by many previous uh, botanists. What we're doing in our flora is not just providing an account of species. Um, we're, we're working currently with a designer uh, on exactly the layout of the flora, but it will, as well as the species account, have a have a chapters on the recording of the flora, on what the habitats and landscapes are that are distinctive to Fenland, which where the flora, uh, our flora exists. And that's what I'm going to focus on uh, this evening, uh, covering uh, chapters on geology, chapters on, uh, chapters on paleoecology, on drainage, which clearly has huge uh, importance in shaping uh, this region. The so and Drainage then passes uh, through social history and agricultural history, uh, shaping both the both the flora and the people who live in Fenland, the Fenland tigers, um, and then how latterly urbanization, transport, the modern world has altered the flora once again, and the latter phase really you can say 1950 and onwards, all the go going back. Re in at Wiccan and one or two other places to the end of the 19th century, looking at habitat conservation and restoration. Each of the species in our flora has these descriptive elements to it. Clearly the scientific name and the vernacular name, but here we're interested in particular in those that were used in the Fenland counties. Some uh, attention to what the variation is within our area and then producing a, um, a tetrad map, we flirted uh, with the idea of a monad map and then realized that we'd need several generations of botanists to uh, provide sufficient data at that scale. So I'm afraid it's uh, in this sense, old fashioned, uh, documenting the uh, distribution of species prior to 1970 in the last 30 years of the 20th century and in the present century. Again, like many floras, it'll get, provide in, information on where the earliest records were, evidence on whether the species is native or introduced. And this is particularly resonant in Fenland, where many species that are undoubtedly native in Britain may be relatively modern uh, arrivals within our region. Uh, we then describe the distribution and habitats within each of those time slots. And thanks to my, uh, my colleague, Mark Hill, we may have made an, an analysis of the distributions of species in Fenland and, able to, uh, and uh, have been able to categorize them into 20 groups, of which more later. And finally, we describe rep reproduction, dispersal, and how important they are for nature conservation. That's the true for what we might call the full accounts, but there are then uh, numerous species which are really quite un, uh, local in Fenland, 
um, occurring in with it with, with less than 25 records in total. And here we have a much more slimmed down account, which you see outlined here. And the end result of that process is to the flora will comprise some 1,000 full species accounts and nearly 2,500 short, uh, shorter accounts, uh, which we hope will give a, uh, a comprehensive a picture of Fenland. It's also, although the focus will be on vascular plants and stoneworts, anything that involves my colleague John, John Graham could not ignore the bryophyta uh, or other algae. And we have uh, what we hope are useful chapters on these species as well. Um, and in, in some respect, in some cases, uh, a first account of these groups within the Fenland Basin. What then was can, uh, motivated us to look at Fenland? Why was it important for wild plants? There's a sense in which looking historically or even prehistorically, Fenland could claim to be the the, one of the most important wetlands anywhere in Northwest Europe. And certainly in a British context, a huge expanse of tall herb rich fen, some localized raised bog and mire forest, the biggest lakes in lowland Britain, alluvial wetlands as one gets closer to the coast, and then amongst the most extensive salt marshes of any region in Britain. As drainage from the Roman period onwards began to take hold, these habitats diminished, but new ones were created in their stead. Uh, so we had lowland meadows created, the drainage channels and navigations for uh, uh, boats became uh, a network of, of important aquatic habitats right across Fenland. And even where there were relics of the previous mires, both fens and bogs, um, many of these were exploited uh, as turf fens through, uh, for peat cutting and for other Fenland project, products. Now, Fenland is, if Fenland, as we would argue, has been to some extent neglected from a flora writer's perspective, it has certainly not been neglected from an archaeological perspective. And we have um, detailed work by Francis Pryor at Flagfen, the remarkable excavations at Must Farm near Whittlesey on a Bronze Age site. Um, we have evidence and, and artifacts from the Iron Age, like Stony Camp and so on. And so through people like um, Harry Godwin and and Francis Pryor and the units at Cambridge University, we have a hugely detailed knowledge of how human beings have lived in and shaped the Fenland landscape. But if I again may claim a sort of retrospective justification, I'm putting in here a, a slide which for me has a double resonance because I live part of my life in uh, Romania. And I would rate Fenland, historically at least, as worthy of mention in the same breath as the current great estuarine wetlands of the Volga, the Danube, the Camargue, the Kotodanyana and the Rhine. Uh, I, I would concede that it doesn't start, it, it is strictly second division compared to those now, but its history is comparable. So what has shaped the flora of Fenland and uh, what happened to the natural habitats that uh, exist, it existed within it. Drainage included ditching and, the, and then the production of, and then the creation of various pumps. And there's lovely historical work, which some of you will be familiar with, uh, recording how technological advance of wind pumps uh, altered land levels and altered the capacity of pumps to drain greater areas of land as they went from wind to steam to diesel and to electric. And then within the land that the pumps had, where, where the pumps had either controlled or removed the surface water, ditches were created 
uh, clay tiles and plastic piping were installed in the fields and the water table in grassland and the newly created arable failed to uh, advantage one group of plants at the expense of others. The relic habitats then that I want to talk about first and then I want to go on to talk about those which were created by the first flush of uh, Fenland management and those that came to replace it as agriculture and drainage became mechanised. So we begin with true fen, salt marsh and the rivers. Historical accounts in Fenland are early begin in the Early, uh, of, of the habitats really begin in the early 19th century. And we have some lovely uh, stories uh, of uh, people visiting Whitt Whittlesea Mere. We have comparable studies by people like J.S. Henslow and uh, Leonard Jennings visiting the Fens northeast of Cambridge. Um, and they record not only the landscape, but also the species. In talking about the landscape, Bree, writing in 1840, said how the mere could uh, uh, be viewed well only from Yaxley, which has got a which is a hill above the fen, and the the rest and the lake itself was protected by a phalanx of tall reeds. He he was there for the before and after of the drainage of the mere, and he was feared that the treasures that he saw in his a journey in 1840 would be destroyed, though we hoped that a few might survive in the dikes. And he was one of the first to see how some species were able to remain as, as sort of viable populations within the newly created habitats, the drainage channels and their banks. <clears throat> so these were some of the species he noticed, and many of them still. Uh, are present within the um, within the Fenland, though most of those sadly have disappeared from the immediate area of uh, Whittlesea Mere. Though the, what a few uh, are present on Home Fen and Wood Walton Fen National Nature Reserves to the south, and the current program to the Great Fen uh, Creation uh, Program is bringing some of these back to more extensive populations. Another area that's worth attention to, as well as this, the Whittlesea Mere area and the great and the wonderful fens of South Cambridgeshire, a special mention should be made of the Deeps, the Great East Fen, between Skegness and Coningsby and as far south as Boston. Here, was an area where raised mires were present as late as the early 19th century and bushels and bushels of cranberries were removed from the raised mire um, to, to feed and to uh, uh, un and underpin also the later drainage. Uh, these, these Fenland products uh, financing the drainage that was later to take place. So there you see the deeps later crisscrossed by a, a grid line of uh, drainage channels which now remain in place. And although the peats uh, are still intact there, the flora has lost most of its uh, Maya species. And um, though there are some calcifuge elements still present in the relics of woodland that were planted on the drained peat. Drainage sometimes occurred dramatically, sometimes it occurred serially. So here's a rather nice diagram reflecting an area north of Terrington St. Clement on the Lincolnshire Norfolk border. And, you, and if you look at that slide, you'll see a whole series of dates where blocks of land, innings of land, were drained, beginning in the uh, late uh, 18th century and going through to the 1970s. Uh, some of which were bear uh, interesting land and uh, names like uh, the Balaclava Farm uh, area, drained immediately after the Crimean War, and Kamarad Farm, drained during the Great War, in a rather hopeful prediction that Germany would be defeated. 
Here, we're looking at what's in Fen Fenland now. We have a sort of a ranking of habitats. We do have natural or better called semi-natural habitats. We have some very special habitats created by drainage. We have habitats which reflect old reclamation. And then we have a, a myriad of habitats associated with habitation and human beings moving into the Fenland. And finally, we have the habitat which dominates the Fenland landscape, that of arable farming. Each one of these has a distinctive species and we've been, uh, with the analysis that our colleague Mark Hill has done reflects how closely they fit into these categories. Fenland, if we look at it over the centuries, would appear to have had huge changes on a millennial scale but it's even had changes within the re what we might call the recent decades or from the 1930s, 40s onward. Um, here is a map created by my colleagues in CEH showing land cover in the Fenland Basin and nicely picking out the lines of the ooze and the f and washes and the neen washes and the black areas of the habitation of the major settlements. But it also can be summer, we can summarize from this what the land cover was and compare it with the first land use survey of Dudley Stamp in the 1930s. And we see that within Fenland, even in that fairly recent period, a lot of land went over from arable into grass, uh, sorry, from grassland into arable, so that. Uh, there, there was a, almost a quarter of the area was grassland and we had a mixed farming economy in the 1930s, but by the present day, it's dominated by arable. Woodlands, interestingly, have increased, though these are, of course, planted woodlands now. Um, so that's a, an interesting, what you might argue, positive change. But orchards as a land use have diminished and the uh, apple and pear and plum industry of Fenland is much diminished compared to how it was the middle of the last century. Let's look at a few Fenland landscapes. Here is a, a, um, an aerial image showing the upper Witham near Fiskerton. And if we look at it, we see a, a distinct line in terms of uh, landscape elements with uneven, irregular fields and curved roads and hedges on the uplands in the southwest corner, the bottom left, but rectangular fields, straight roads, straight ditches and embankments uh, once we get into Fenland. A, a characteristic of Fenland is the isolation of certain habitats, some of them semi-natural, like this decoy woodland at Friskney. And there we have an island rich in bryophytes and pteridophytes, and also with a few flowering plants such as Ceratocapnos um, that are, are isolated from local any other local populations by uh, sometimes tens of kilometers. We have coastal habitats, sometimes displaying a very sharp line, thanks to sea, uh, sea defense fences, between the natural or semi-natural and the highly artificial, so that uh, we can date the age of habitats to maybe within 10 or 20 years, uh, just in land of the seawall, and look at impacts of improved sea defences. One group of habitats that demand and landscape and a landscape type that demands special attention is that of washland and its associated drains here seen by the glen at baston and the neen uh, at morton's leem near whittlesey uh, these are some of our most important habitats not just for aquatics but also for grassland species and relic fen species landscape diversity can also be created by urbanization and industry. Now it happens that my colleague John lives in Whittlesey and I first became interested in the Fenland flora living in Whittlesey itself. So that is that town is the birthplace of this idea of a flora. And if you look at this image of Fenland, 
you see both the urban habitats of Whittles Island and the ancient Fen Causeway, that straight line along the bottom of this image. You see old grasslands at the edge of the Fenland Island, uh, which have remained as grasslands largely because of people of horsey culture, people having uh, domestic ponies. And then we have the regularly flooded land of the Washland Meadows between Morton's Leam and the Tidal Neen. But we also have these habitats created by extractive industries, clay pits or gravel pits, um, some of which date back um, a couple of centuries, some of which are still active. And then we have the great change which has shaped Fenland in the last 30 years, that of habitat creation. Uh, it, is, um, it is arguable, at least, that Fenland is the national centre for habitat creation and restoration in Britain. And some of the schemes within Fenland are very extensive, covering three, 4,000 hectares or more. Now, each of the habit species that we've seen in Fenland, its distribution has been analysed by my colleague, um, Mark Hill, and he has done this analysis, which please don't ask me about the statistics when it comes to the questions, um, what, he, what, he, what he calls a spherical k-means clustering analysis. Uh, I have worked with Mark long enough to trust him implicitly, uh, and I hope um, that uh, any questions on the methods, you will refer to him in the future, not to me. His analysis produced 20 separate species clusters. Um, and here you see them with the number of species that were present within each of those clusters. Uh, they, so these are species with similar distributions within the Fenland Basin. So, so the maps that I'm going to show you uh, um, they are what you might call co-occurrence maps. So we overlay the tetrad maps of all these species in each one of these clusters. And where there are a lot of species uh, of, of each cluster present, you get a big dark brown dot. Where you get just a, a reasonable number, but not a huge number, you get a small mid-brown dot. And where there are relatively few species of the cluster present, you just get a little grey dot. So that helps you, I hope, interpret these maps. Now, some of these um, maps uh, will, I'm sure, me merit the kind of so what um, appearance, but uh, some uh, do beg interesting ecological questions. So groups of species include the salt marsh cluster, which no, obviously enough, follows the coast and the tidal rivers, uh, but does have uh, outliers where there are uh, relic uh, saline habitats, uh, where the tidal influence has been controlled more recently. The coast and sand cluster is very obviously confined to the Snettisham, Heacham and Stanton area. But you will might notice an outlier there at March in Cambridgeshire, where we have a cluster of coastal species growing on old railway sidings. The sort of habitats we get, these are some of the grandest habitats in Fenland. Uh, and the only claim really that we have now to wilderness within our area. But my goodness, it is huge and wild. The habitat that people want to have in Fenland is that of the true fen, the rich fen uh, cluster. Um, and it's a very rich cluster of species. There are many species that show this distribution, but most of them are confined just to a very small group of areas within Fenland. So you will see that uh, Wiccan Fen in the bottom uh, right of that map is picked out and just below that, a rather sad dot for Kwai Fen. And then over in the bottom left of the map, we have Home Fen and particularly Wood Walton. And further north on the west side on, on the left of the map, 
we have Baston Fen, and over on the east side of the map, we have the area around Wormgi and so on, uh, uh, Mofen and so on, uh, near, uh, near Sheldon Warren. Another habitat that occurs on these peats at the edge of Fenland is that of old peat woodland. Now, woodlands as a native part of Fenland disappeared in the middle of the 20th century when the great woods at Doddington and at Linwood near March were, let, were felled. So the only woodlands we have which can claim to be semi-natural are those that have developed through scrub invasion in old fens and those which have either been planted and then developed as semi -wild, as, as wild habitats on peatlands elsewhere. So the same areas that we saw for the fen, uh, the rich fen habitat, are picked out as important, but there are scattered habit places throughout Fenland. There is also a major block uh, in the lower Nar Valley and to up, uh, along the east edge of Fen, Fenland, north of uh, Kings Lynn. And very interestingly, a group of habit uh, sites are around the edge of the Witham, where there are quite a number of small woodlands on the peat, often created as decoy woodlands. The next group of habitats then, and the species that occur in them, are those that um, were brought about by the first phase of drainage. The washes as a safety valve for flood water, the channels, both field and roadside ditches, the big IDB drains, co um, taking water from each of these field ditches and the major arterial drains. We also have the habitats of reservoirs and worked out and flooded pits and associated with them flood banks. Uh, one of the most important grassland habitats within Fenland. Washes uh, really do have a very distinctive flora uh, being, uh, being signified here, dominated by the ooze washes and the neen washes, but also with smaller clusters along the cam and the lark, and quite an interesting set down the glen from Baston through to Pinchbeck. Interestingly, the, the same group of species occur by the Babingley River in the northeast of Fenland near Kings Lynn. The other natural or habitat or semi-natural habitat is that of the canalised river and the main drain. And here we have a group of species which, who's, which are characterised by, the, by, the, by these large channels, but where brackish by tidal water is excluded from them. So a group of species which are almost entirely absent from the marshland, the area last drained within Fenland, but as soon as one gets away from the saline and brackish influence, they're well represented in all the main channels. Things like yellow water lily are obvious uh, examples of this group, but there are many other species within that grouping. In the same block of Fenland, so again, largely excluding the washland um, marshes and the, in, and the silt fens towards the wash, we have species which occur in two distinct um, ditch habitats. Now, by ditch and drain, I mean, normally we use the word ditch to mean uh, a field ditch of, or, or roadside ditch of under two metres width and a drain might be something slightly bigger. But in this case, we're using them to mean a watercourse that is subject to regular and frequent cleaning and ones which are characteristic of the bank and the shore and the very shallow edge of the ditches and drains themselves. And you'll see these two groupings have very similar distributions in Fenland, again, picking out the washes, picking out the south of Cambridgeshire, but also picking out uh, the Witham Valley as an important area. So species, there. this is a kind of a, uh, a, a, a picture of the kind of habitat I'm alluding to and some of the most familiar plants that characterise the drainage flora, such as Mentha aquatica and the water forget-me-not. 
A subset of this habitat is found along the west side of Fenland, where we have field ditches which are influenced by groundwater coming off the uh, li either the oolitic limestone or further south in Cambridgeshire coming off the chalk. And in these areas where water quality is especially high, we get plants like the opposite leaved pondweed, whose map you see there. And we also get really quite large populations of the lesser water plantain, Baldelia, uh, often growing in precisely the same drains as Greenland Greenlandia. Also within the ditches, we have a, a habitat which extends further towards the washes and is characterized by the tall emergence, not just Phragmites, uh, but also Spalganium, whose map you see here, Bulbachinus, the sea club rush, Phalaris, and various Glycerias, and so on. So the swamp habitat, as it extends uh, right throughout Fenland, and is present even as an impoverished version in some of the marshes toward the wash. The habitats created by um, civilization, as it were, include these uh, old grasslands, they include hedges, and they include churchyards. And they're very much associated with the drainage infrastructure and the early stages of reclamation. So that one of the most remarkable areas of old grassland, for example, is along the Neen outfall, where defences against tidal water uh, very early created a grassland which is now two to three hundred years old and has a very rich flora, as good as many areas of chalk and limestone grassland within our region. Not so rich in species, but often very floriferous, are old sea banks uh, themselves. This is an area at Wrangell, near, uh, right on the Washland shore. So the left-hand side of that picture actually includes a tiny bit of tidal uh, salt marsh. But the lee side of the flood bank there has a, a, a very nice area of grassland with a lot of cowslips. Uh, various kinds of buttercup, and nothing, if you like, to, uh, but a, a rich relict grassland. Habitats that are, um, come into this category, or uh, where, from the analysis then, include this old virgin bank group, species that we find in Fenland growing either on these oldest flood banks that have been were established in the early phases of drainage or the old grass verges which go back to the first road networks um, dating back to the original reclamation of the marshes and here we see a very clear pattern beginning to emerge um, if you look uh, on this on this map you'll see an arc going around the edge of the wash, but inland of it, marking the so-called townlands from King's Lynn through Hull Beach to uh, Spalding, Boston, and up to Wainfleet, where the landscape is older, where the villages are longer established. Going further south into Cambridgeshire, we have, habit we have the old Fenland Islands of March, of Whittlesea, of Chatteris, and especially that big block towards the bottom of the map of Ely. The Moan Verge group is a very clear cluster in our analysis, but its distribution begs some questions because it seems to favour two counties, uh, Norfolk and uh, North Lincolnshire, Vice County 54. And one wonders actually whether it's picking up the impact of uh, particular district councils and their uh, uh, activities in mowing verges and suppressing the tall, the tall and coarse species that characterize grasslands, uh, the most verges elsewhere. The, then we have our closest approximation to old grassland habitats remaining in Fenland. The, what the map on the left shows what we call the old grassland cluster. Now you'll see there in the smack bang in the middle of the map, not far south of the wash, we see that group of uh, 
flood banks around Wisbeach and going out towards Sutton Bridge, so the Neen outfall. But our main clusters of old grassland are down to the southeast around Soham, down to the southwest around Swavesea, and especially on the Isle of Ely itself, a land which clearly has had grassland um, on this higher lying, higher lying ground for many centuries. The habitat we call dry open grassland is less easy to uh, explain at first, but when one sees where, which sites are representative, represented, it seems to be very much a group of species linked to sand, gravel, and especially railway cinder and ballast. So we have the gravel and clay pits and uh, of the Whittlesea area. Uh, we have similar pits throughout the south and east of Fenland, particularly in the lower Nar, and we have the more natural sand, uh, sandy ground uh, around Snettisham and Heacham. There's also an important block up towards the north edge of Fenland uh, around Tattershall in Lincolnshire, where again, there's a, there are large gravel uh, workings with open gravelly land colonized by many species of which um, this sort of habitat is, uh, is, is, is very representative and where the most characteristic species is probably the mouse ear hawkweed. But lots and lots of species which would be familiar to anybody working in a sand in on sandy heath or dunes uh, uh, or the Breckland uh, have these sort of scattered sporadic Fenland sites where there is old industry and uh, the ha and the soils uh, are dry, nutrient poor, and often highly calcareous. Wooded habitats. Apart from that wood, uh, that uh, peat woodland habitat I mentioned earlier, are really quite restricted in Fenland. Hedge, we have a, a group of species which we call the tree belt cluster. Um, they include not only um, trees planted as specimens along roadsides for shelter belts and so on. They include some of the older hedges on Fenland islands. And uh, for example, the photograph you see on the left uh, at South Kyme in Lincolnshire, uh, where we've got hedges with dog's mercury and other old woodland species present within them. And we have later hedges that were planted for amenity and for, and for biodiversity with a different suite of species. So the map of the tree belt cluster shows clusters are so um, is, is well represented again on the Fenland Islands and towards the south around some of the relic fens but then again follows that arc from Kings Lynn along the south side of the Wash through Boston and Spalding and up to Wainfleet reflecting once again the areas of oldest reclamation. Some of the um, habitats that are present in Fenland as uh, within the sort of reclaimed and uh, managed Fenland uh, show, show, species, show very obvious causes or they have, we have species which are just ubiquitous in these roadside and waste ground habitats, things like Aranathrum, or species which have spread recently as our road network has become more and more uh, uh, busy and used and therefore treated with roadside salt. So these sorts of habitats, in a, a cluster, we've, we've got clusters reflecting each of these features of the landscape, the roads, urban habitats, the engineering created by the navigation and um, drainage system and latterly by the roads, and then associated with broken tarmac and gravel gateways and so on. There's a very large group of species which we've called the homestead cluster. And these include all kinds of plants from uh, aliens such as Budlia through to uh, archaeophytes uh, like um, the ground elder, just to native species like wallpepper and so on. And here, the, the, where these species are most frequent picks out the urban, uh, the urban areas of, Whittles, uh, of, of Fenland. Uh, again, the particularly 
Kings Lynn, Wisbeach, Ely, uh, March, Whittlesey, um, Spalding, and Boston, and so on. But like, but represented to a lesser degree to wherever there is a village with uh, uh, urban habitats present within it. Very similar in its Fenland distribution is the churchyard cluster. Now, um, most of the old parish churches, the Anglican churches within Fenland, date back to the early periods of reclamation. So that arc around the edge of the wash is again picked out, as are the Fenland Islands at March and Ely. Um, but um, there is some evidence of species which colonized these grasslands as they were created in the medieval and later period, some evidence that the species typical of these clusters are arriving in the free church and non-conformist chapel yards that uh, became were created in the 19th century and which are more widespread within Fenland. The wall habitat is to some extent, or the wall cluster I should say, is to some extent a more a subset of this urban and habitation cluster and focus it and really does pick out two settlements, Wisbeach and Ely, those two pairs of very large dark brown dots you see there, as having the most area of old brickwork, stonework and so on. Ely obviously through its medieval and later importance as an ecclesiastical and uh, and, uh, and educational centre, and Wisbeach as a key port uh, in for Fenland and for the whole of East Anglia. It's interesting that Boston is not picked out by this, so that Boston uh, does not have the kind of special wall habitats that uh, its sister port of Wisbeach does have. There are some clusters which, in a sense, tell us very little. The ubiquitous wayside cluster characterised by Aranathrum and Caps and so on and, and uh, Cooch and uh, Coxfoot grass is everywhere within Fenland. And the arable and disturbed cluster um, where species like um, Shepherd's Purse, Capsella, are particularly distinctive, is almost as widespread. But it's interesting that it thins out a bit in western Lincolnshire. And we, we are racking our brains even now as we write the concluding cha uh, contextual chapters for the flora as to why that might be so. So these are the sort of species which, yes, no great, no great news there. These are everywhere in Fenland. There is then one group of species which we've re alluded to, we've referred to as the broad-leaved arable group. Um, I have a feeling, in retrospect, that we might be better have called them the uh, light soil arable group, because they're particularly found on the peats and where there is a sandy influence in the soil, but they're almost absent uh, in southern Lincolnshire and towards the wash where the soils are heavier. So um, it's they, they do, why we call it the broad-leaved arable group is because they tend to be species, uh, and you can see uh, at the bottom of this slide, the kind of, um, habit species that are most typical of that, including things like the allseed, lipandra, uh, the scarlet pimpernel and so on. All of them in Fenland tend to be associated with um, sugar beet, potatoes uh, and so on, rather than cereals. But um, it's not a hard and fast rule by any means. And almost as a conclusion, I want to just show you some other exemplar maps. We've seen the distribution of habitats and the groups of species that characterize those habitat types in Fenland. But here are some exemplars. Seeing I've already alluded to uh, uh, the mouse ear hawkweed, Pilicella, there you see its distribution map in Fenland. And you see very much how it's associated with the, mar the sandy margins of Fenland 
and then areas where there is sand and gravel extraction or abandoned old railways um, within the basin. To the left, we have one of the species, I think that in Finland, we will, uh, we, we will have to make a fuss about. Uh, many assessments of the world water milfoil, Myriophyllum verticillatum, um, would, would report its decline. But in some parts of Finland, it's still quite abundant, even in quite turbid drains. And although there are losses, particularly in Cambridgeshire, it does appear to uh, be holding its own in many parts of Finland, particularly where there are higher quality IDB drains. That sort of story applies, but even in a more extreme way, to the plant on the right, the fen pondweed. Here is a species which, although it's an aquatic, is picked out, not surprisingly, by the relic rich fen cluster. And it picks, and that, so our, it, it occurs principally uh, in the Wiccan area and around Whittlesea, uh, where it's found in everything from clay pits to uh, Dra drains uh, by the washes. It occurs in the Baston area and it occurs sparingly over by the Little Ooze at Lakenheath. But it's uh, really um, a species which whose national map picks out Fenland. And if you looked at the, the Hectad map published in the recent act atlas, you would gain the impression that it's quite common in Fenland. Uh, it's still widespread and locally very frequent. But as you can see, that frequency is based on really a few uh, a few groups of sites rather than um, general abundance. The salt marsh, it's interesting that as well now looking to the left hand map, how uh, species that belong to semi-natural clusters, if you will, like the salt marsh cluster, um, ha are, will have picked up those plants which are also colonizing salted roadsides. So there is our map of Spergularia marina, where its natural distribution around the wash is increasingly masked and disguised by the spread inland. Two other maps of, of real interest. What the species on the left, the pyramidal orchid, is, I suppose, is a species that I think we would argue is not native to Fenland. And uh, certainly its habitats were are all those created either by the early stages of drainage or clearance of the woodland on the Fenland Islands. Um, and so where it occurs now is usually habitats that are at most two or three centuries old. But we have in some areas really quite large populations of the pyramidal orchid and other associated old grassland species. Of more um, pertinent uh, relevance to Fenland as a natural region with natural habitats, we have the Washland cluster. The Washland group of species to some extent bridges the gap between the tall herb rich fens present at Wiccan, Wood Walton, Baston, and so on, and um, the wet grasslands that are more widespread in our region. So that here we get species which were able to colonize new grasslands as they were created by flood defense works and moved from what one assumes were natural fen meadows and, me and fen habitats into the washlands and and have remained happily still quite frequent there. Though as you I look at the map here for the tubular water drop work shows how it has declined in most of its outlying habitats and sites away from the major washlands of the Ouse, Neen and Glen. I wanted to sort of draw attention finally, last of all, to that theme that I developed right at the beginning which was uh, what about Penland restoration and creation? Uh, it is the center of activity for this sort of um, creative conservation in Britain, with the latest one being Wild Ken Hill, which includes a large area of what we would call Fen towards the Wash Shore, but has now the old established sites towards the south and west of the Fenland Edge. There is our summary map of Fenland richness. 
It picks out certain areas unsurprisingly as extremely rich, such as Wiccan Fen and the Isle of Ely. And it also picks out the Fen Islands and the area of settlements. We have this urban effect of species which were which are associated with the early stages of reclamation or have arrived in Fenland with, uh, as escapes or uh, neophytes uh, in recent decades. And then we have these other hotspot habitats of washes, of the old grasslands where they exist, of the river floodplains themselves, and this interesting comparison between the relic peats, the skirting peats and the silts of the marshland. And we have sometimes inflated richness along the Fenland edge, where tetrad data uh, sometimes uh, include species which are not really growing in the Fenland. So, having gone on for over 50 minutes, I will stop and ask whether there are any questions. Thank you very much for listening. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Owen. That was a fantastic talk. Um, coming from Cornwall, the, the, the whole Fenland region is, is quite, quite different to what I'm used to. Those photos that you were showing of really flat, wide landscapes is, is such a... Yes, it's just so so different to what I'm used to. I'm used to sort of rolling, undulating hills, moorland, mm. um, grassland, and stuff like that. But it was a really fa really fantastic, fascinating talk. Thank you. Think, um, yeah, sorry. I, well, I think I I I, I sympathise with anyone who um, who finds in Finland um, a degree of tedium, mm. but. I hope that the flora and it's uh, it were both a bit, will show what how much there is of real interest still present. And a personal note, I moved down. I was I lived in the West Riding of Yorkshire and County Durham until I was fifteen, and became a botanist. Uh, the, the the month I moved down to live in Fenland, and so um, for me, uh, Fenland means botany. Mm. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I'd I'd love to I'd love to go to the Penland. Um, I've got a friend that lives in uh, Norwich, um, and hopefully I will be able to make my way over because I seeing those drains absolutely full of aquatic plants would just it'd be fascinating to just stick on a pair of waders and just have a look at all the all the interesting plants. So we've got our first question through on the Q and A. So uh, from Jan Blake, a really interesting talk. Thank you very much. When is the flora to be published? <laughs> yes, um, the, 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 if anybody has heard me talk before, they will say, we thought it was going to be out by now, Owen. Um, I, I, my only defence is that of talking with fellow flora writers who said that the last few yards are the difficult bit. Um, where we have all the species accounts uh, and 90% of the contextual chapters are written. So we are writing the last of the contextual chapters now, then compiling it into the structure to go to our designer. It, we will then be able to get a publication date from them. Um, and I would hope that would be within 2024. Uh, I'm expecting certainly to pass the material across to our designer and publisher um, by by mid to late summer at the very worst uh, and then it's how long it takes them to do the work well it's, it's an incredibly ambitious project so it's no no wonder it's taken <laughs> yeah I mean, in my defense i would say that uh, as an area um well in that, uh, it's about as big it's about as big as lincolnshire or norfolk it's a big area and um We've had some very, very uh, enthusiastic contributors, thank goodness, but it doesn't get quite the attention even now that uh, an area like uh, West Cornwall would, or mm -hmm. the Somerset, or, or, or Somerset would. So, uh, yeah, we, it, we're we're glad to have got as far as we have. Mm. So I've got a question I'd like to ask. Um, so you mentioned something about, uh, well, you, you mentioned uh, habitat restoration in the Fenland. And uh, I think towards the beginning of your talk, you had a, a list of, of species um, that were being sort of restored uh, across the Fenland. 
Um, and I was wondering whether or not um, are, the, are these species being restored from like local populations? Yeah, the, what's happening in Finland at the moment is um, it the beauty the beauty of having so many schemes is we've got lots of different approaches. So in um, Kingfisher Bridge, Kingfisher's Bridge, for example, between Wiccan and Streatham, we have a very proactive approach where it happened that the original the scheme included one of the only uh, British sites for muckwater gemander, Teucrium scordium. And so they went in for wholesale reintroduction of that species onto new habitat on the site. And now we have a huge population. They followed that through then by uh, getting green hay from Chippenham Fen. And, and that's brought in things like Salinum carvifolia, the Cambridge milk parsley. So we have that kind of proactive approach. Then uh, we have people just developing um, suitable cultivation techniques or lack of them. Uh, suitable water tables and letting nature take its course, much more or less a fair approach. And that's being adopted really in places where there are nuclei of good Fenland species right next door, such as at Wiccan or on the Great Fen, where you've got Wood Walton and Home Fen. And to a lesser extent, um, up at uh, Baston Fen, where you've got the Willow Tree uh, Fen project, uh, where they've sort of combined natural regen uh, natural colonization with a scheme to um, reintroduce the great water parsnip, Siam lati uh, latifolium. So, it, so all of these reintroduction programs are based on local provenance material. Um, but uh, so I'm happy to say, but um, they they tend to they're only in a few, very few cases. It's, yes, the only cases where there is broad scale introduction of a lot of species probably would be Kingfisher's Bridge. Uh, but that all of that is based on green hay taken from a uh, an NNR, so a local NNR. So, yeah, I think you, we could argue it's defensible. Brilliant. Well, um, I, I don't know. If, I don't know if you caught last month's uh, talk, but that was uh, about uh, using plants of local provenance to. Mm. Um, to restore uh, wetland habitat. So it's um, quite, quite a point and it's a topic that's quite quite close to my heart. Um, so we've got a question here from uh, Philip Townsend. So hi Owen, great to see you again after joining you when you led a botany tour to the Dolomites. I wanted to ask to what extent plant reintroductions have been undertaken or established in the Fenland? So you, you briefly mentioned that a minute ago. And also, can you give a sense of how many plant species have been lost completely in the last few decades? That's yeah. Oh, that's a very good question, and uh, I'm remiss in not having um, got the totals at my fingertips. Uh, there are quite a few species. I mean, the big changes in Fenland in terms of extinctions happened in the 19th and early 20th century, but there have but there have been considerable losses also locally, even within protected areas uh, in the post Second World War period. Um, so species that have gone from Fenland in that time, um, that's a good question. My, um, I will try, I, I, I will try when I, one, one chapter I haven't written is the kind of exploration of Fenland chapter, which would give, provide me with precisely those data. My uh, assumption would be it's, it's probably between 40 and 50 old Fenland species have become extinct in the last 50 to 70 years. And those would include things like um, Parnassia palustris, Pinguicula vulgaris. Um, for a, um, we probably have lost all our native many anthes. It's probably only ever a garden escape now with us. So things like that. Some species are right on their last legs. So uh, Pedicularis palustris growing at... Um, uh, Wood Walton Fen and um, at Wiccan Carex Apropin Quarter. So, so that we we uh, we have species which, were it not for these nature reserves, would I am sure have joined the others. Um, the the fact that Wiccan in particular is picked out 
as a, a hotspot for species richness largely reflects the fact that it was protected from the late 19th century onward. Um, so that the, that date of protection meant, means that a lot, a lot of species hung on there, which, would, which were extirpated in the next 50, 60 years elsewhere. Um, do you know if there are like any efforts to try and connect these um, these quite important uh, nature reserves at all with with like corridors or anything like like that? Yes. Wildlife corridors. Yes, there are, and uh, something that I mean, I, I didn't use it in my map of uh, habitat um, restoration and landscape restoration schemes, but because it in a sense is too diffuse. But there is uh, the project which has got. Uh, um, lottery funding called New Life on the Old West, whose function is to connect the sort of Wiccan area along the Old West River, which is the natural course of the uh, Great Ouse, with the washes towards Erith and, um, Str and, and Sutton. Now that in, uh, would will create a um, a uh, but not only a corridor of restored habitat, but also it will work hand in hand with the internal drainage boards. Because one of the most influential groups of people in Fenland are the IDBs. Um, particular mention should be made of the middle level commissioners, but also the north level. Um, and then the, and places like the Wiccan fourth, uh, fourth uh, IDB up in the north, you can, uh, where these people are in charge of drainage management, uh, there is often a very close correlation between their activity and their involvement in more recent restoration schemes and the richness of the flora. Um, I'm, not hope, I'm not hoping to shame other water managers, but uh, certainly um, the, the IDBs I've mentioned will come out very proudly from uh, the analysis of the flora that we've done. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, so we've got a question here from uh, Alan Reza uh, saying, thank you for this fantastic talk. You mentioned some important information on relic habitats. I wonder whether or not they could play, uh, uh, whether or not they could play a role as a refugium for future relic species in regards of climate change? They might do. I mean, apart from the, yeah, that that's a the development of the Fenland landscape means that the relic, I'm not going to call them relic habitats so much as relic assemblages of species. You'll see why in a moment. Well, those will include the grasslands created around the parish churches. The grasslands are along the old flood banks from the 17th century works of Vermoyden and so on onwards. The pastures and meadows that survived around the Fenland Islands, which were originally there to um, service draft animals, and now I say are part of the pony culture of, uh, uh, of, of the landscape. Um, so that, and then the, the, the very fact of the creation of the drainage network from the earliest uh, drains uh, created like, like the Car Dyke, uh, a Roman canal, and those created by the abbeys um, at the edge of the Fenland in the medieval period through to the, the Dutch engineers of the 17th century. Many of these, these features of the landscape were created when the adjacent flora was certainly richer than it was in the mid to late 20th century. And so they acquired an assembly of species um, which w w has then survived and could form the nuclei for later con later conservation and later spread. The problem with some of them is connectivity to other habitats. You know, it's back to that question that you asked a moment ago. And um, with, the the, with the special case of uh, pits, uh, both gravel, clay and burrow pits, um, we have... Uh, a sad phenomenon. When I came to live in the Fenland at the end of the 1960s, and indeed when my colleague uh, uh, John Graham started work here at the end of the 90s, beginning of the 2000s, 
um, gravel and clay pits were um, a, could, were a bonanza for botanists, not only aquatics, but also marginal species. And, and if the pit was old enough in terms of abandonment, even grassland and scrub species. But many of the, these old pits are now, have more recently been developed uh, as boating facilities, or the worst of all cases are those developed as carp fisheries. Because when that happens, uh, to produce lots of carp, people put in lots and lots of ground bait and the water very rapidly becomes turbid and full of algae and the aquatic and marginal flora disappears. So that these refuges, which could have been nuclei for um, spread, uh, some of them are at this moment quite threatened. Yeah, we've got a, a, I don't want to say a, a quite a similar issue, but in down, down in Cornwall, we've obviously we've had a lot of mining history down in Cornwall and um, a lot of our mine sites, a lot of our, our waste sites and stuff like that, they've developed quite an interesting bryophyte flora. Mm -hmm. But quite a lot of those sites, because the mining has stopped, waste isn't added to them anymore. So the the accumulation of heavy metal is, has stopped. And um, as, it's, as it rains quite a lot in Cornwall, all of that rain flushes out all of the heavy metals over time. Yeah. And you end up with encroachment of species that are not able to tolerate the high heavy metal levels, but because the heavy metal levels are lowering, they're able to move in and, you know, they, they displace the quite rare and interesting species. So, yeah. Um, so we've got a question here from Jonathan Shanklin. Mm -hmm. So in terms of change over the last 20 years, which are the top winners and losers? Which are the winners and the losers in the last 20 years? Mm -hmm. mm. Good question, Jonathan. You, you're probably, within the Cambridgeshire context, you're probably uh, more, more able to co co uh, comment than I am. But in uh, thinking for Fenland as a whole, the, their... Um, the winners I am of, are largely the ones you would expect. They include a whole body of neophytes, um, which many of which were not present within the Fenland flora until, say, 1950 or 1970 or even 2000, but are now common everywhere. There are, I, I'm all there are some species. Uh, within the native flora, which appear to be winning. And it's again, it's an interesting question as to why this might be so. Um, two of those that I think are worth drawing attention to are Potomageton compressus, the glass rack pondweed, which, whose spread in the northern fens of Cambridgeshire and adjacent areas might well be to do with connection to the, uh, through the Neen to the Grand Union and so on. So that might be a, a, an impact of boating. And then Torrelis arvensis, the spreading burr parsley, which uh, certainly when I first started botanizing in Fenland in the late 60s, early 70s, was, out, was absent, um, uh, but it is now quite regularly seen uh, in arable headlands and the upper disturbed banks of ditches from places like March and Whittlesea North to Bourne and beyond. Um, so that I would say is a winner. Real losers, um, I think the possibly the most obvious real loser in, uh, in uh, of the native flora in my lifetime would be things like um, Potomageton coloratus and uh, to some extent Grunlandia. And then species which uh, who's, which don't reflect land use change, but reflect land management change. Those that uh, are sensitive to altered agriculture, uh, to higher nutrient levels. And the losers there would include things like Euphorbia exigua, Galliopsis speciosa, Buglosoides arvensis, um, and real, very much so, uh, Papava argemini. When I first arrived in Fenland, uh, again, it was a species I saw quite frequently in sandy, play, sa by sand pits and uh, light peaty margins of arable fields. 
I haven't seen it myself in Finland for 20 years or more. Uh, some people have. It's still on our list. But those are real losers. Right. Thank you. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a shame, isn't it, to, to monitor the decline of quite, quite interesting species. Um, so we've got uh, another question here from uh, Seska Beamish. So fascinating cluster analysis. How did you ensure the records in each tetrad were not strongly affected by recorder bias? Uh -huh. habitat being more thoroughly examined. Yeah, that's a, a, that's a very good. We can um, the, you the, Mark takes took would took uh, takes account of observer visits. Um, John and I, that's John Graham and I, have conducted surveys in all what is about two thousand uh, tetrads, I think in Finland, something like that, um, so that we heard, so that. There is a kind of safety net of common, what you might call a common intensity. But of course you're right. Um, the um, correction for the number of botanists visiting observer effort, um, again, you would have to ask Mark as to how that was done, but it, it, will, it does need doing because uh, Wiccan, Wood Walton, Baston, um, receive much more effort than anywhere else in Finland. Um, and areas like Wisbeach and to a lesser extent Boston receive quite a lot of effort simply because they have botanists living there. And so you have people walking the streets, walking their dogs or shopping and adding species on waste ground and walls and so on. So they have, they too get uh, increased um uh, observer effort. So I think it's a real problem. But my judgment would be that though there, though it will be inflated in places, the overall patterns in richness are very plausible in that they do reflect very largely date of reclamation, quality, water quality, and presence of relic habitat, um, and often proximity to the Fenland edge or to the mar or to the margins of a Fenland island. And so because the association with those features is so good, uh, I sort of I, I, I believe that the trends that we're showing uh, are real, even if somewhat exaggerated. Yeah, I, I can certainly attest to recorder bias in Cornwall for sure. If if you look at any sort of maps of Cornwall, you'll often see the lizard just lighting up yes. compared to the rest of Cornwall. I, I live in um north northeast Cornwall, which is one of the least botanized places of Cornwall because it's just so there aren't many roads. If you don't have a car, it's quite difficult to get to places. The terrain is quite inhospitable. Um but yeah, so Worth it just a quick footnote to that point you've made. I'm not, um, F Fenland is in the southeast of England, uh, and you'd think um, very accessible, but mm. we have quite a number of tetrads with no public right of way within them. Um, and even where there is a public right of way, I was accosted, but not um, not in a nasty way, by a, a farmer dur during a survey that I was doing on a dead end public road. He said, I was amazed by what you were doing, what you were up to. I thought, what's that man doing on this road? Because you're the first person to travel on this road that I know of who wasn't coming to see me. <laughs> so so we were talking about the flat southeast of England, but actually a very remote landscape mm -hmm. in some areas. Yeah, I've I've had plenty of experiences with uh, landowners curious as to what I'm doing, and very often they'll come to me with a slight hint of aggression in their voices. Yeah. And as soon as I tell them that I'm just here looking for plants, they they lighten up and they're they're yeah. quite happy there, and they just say, "Here's my email. Could you just send me a list of what you find?" That's what that's what most that's exactly what most farmers want. They in fact, uh, especially if you identify little hot spots on their land. Uh, I know that uh, that uh, several have gone on to manage those areas sympathetically, mm. or you know, have submitted them for agri-environment schemes or something. 
Yeah. So I don't think we've got any more questions coming through. So I'm going to call it an end to the questions this evening. We are approaching nine o'clock. So I'd like to thank you, Owen, for your time and your expertise this evening. It was great talk. I've learned quite a lot. Um, and I would encourage anyone in the audience with any further questions to get in touch with, with Owen if, yeah. if that's um, do you have a website uh, for the uh, Yes, there, there, there is a, a, a rather old, uh, it's not been updated recently because we've been concentrating on writing, but there is a page uh, on the BSPI website called the Fenland Flora, uh, which where you can access our emails, and that's John's email and mine, um, and uh, we, we'll be delighted to hear from, from you, from anyone who... Um, and my last point would be, I hope uh, this is a special message to those who've heard me talk before. I hope there was something novel in what I said tonight. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'd also like to just thank uh, Sarah Woods, who's been the the, the tech wizard behind uh, this season's uh, BSBI Winter Talks. Um, Sarah Woods is uh, the BSBI Fundraising and Engagement Manager. And without her work, this really wouldn't be possible. So a big thank you to her. Um, and I'd like to also thank the audience for their questions and time uh, this winter. Um, and the BSBI Winter Talks will resume again um, this coming winter. Uh, so if any of the audience has any sort of burning desire to present a talk, um, please contact either myself or Sarah. I believe an email will be going around at some point tomorrow uh, and our contact details will be on that email. So just, just send, us, uh, send us a message or anything. Um, so finally, it's been my great pleasure to chair these talks and I greatly look forward to continuing them later this year. So thank you all for coming and have a lovely evening. <laughs>